Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Worship in Spirit and Truth. And in recent programs we've been looking at what the Old Testament has to teach about worship. And we've noticed that there's a remarkable difference between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. For example, in the Old Testament, there was a specific place where God's people had to come to worship Him. They had to do certain specific things like offer sacrifices and so forth. There was a special class of people called the priests through whom they had to find their access to God. But when we come to the New Testament, we find all that's changed because Jesus Christ is the perfect fulfillment of all those things. And so now there is no special place where we need to go in order to worship God because there's now no temple which is a must for us to go, no holy place where we must go in order to worship God to fulfill some kind of act of righteousness. Not at all. Worship in spirit and truth means that we can draw near to God wherever we are, at whatever time, day or night, whether we're on our own, whether we're with people or not. It's about personal and intimate communion with God through faith in Jesus Christ. But there were also in the Old Testament certain people, prophets, priests, and kings. And these were used by God to draw us into a relationship with Him. Today, we're going to see how that relates to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Now, we know that the Old Testament system required full-time officials to take responsibility for the worship and to supervise what went on. The scriptures often refer to the gatekeepers who had to act as stewards to bring people in, the musicians who were in charge of the worship, the singers, the choirs, the skilled worship work, workers who served in the temple. But the kings, the priests, and the prophets were always the key figures in Israel's worship. The kings. Throughout the whole history of Israel and Judah, the kings played an important part in public worship. For example, it was the kings who established centers of worship. The kings who often took responsibility for religious policy making. It was the kings who on many occasions conducted worship. We know that it was King Solomon who built the first temple. And uh, he offered a thousand sacrifices. And he made sure that everything was in place. And he prayed that great prayer of dedication of the temple. That God would be there. That God, He said, I know you don't live in a temple made with hands. Not even heaven or the highest heaven can contain you. Still less this little house I've built. But I want you to put your name here. I want you to manifest your presence here. And so, as a result of that, you can say that Solomon was really directing the whole worship life of the nation, as his father David had done in the tabernacle of David. And many of the prophets even looked back to that time and said, I wish we could get back to that time when we used to worship God in the tabernacle and not put our faith and trust in, these, in this great temple as fine as it is. Then, of course, we have the priests. It's clear what their role was in terms of the offering of sacrifices and so forth. But after the exile and the end of the monarchy, the priests took on an even more political role. Their spiritual functions as priests were still important, but they had a stronger say in what went on in the worship life of the nation. And we see that uh, throughout the history of, uh, of the worship life of the Old Testament, the priests had a key role. They cared for the sanctuaries throughout the land. They gave advice when consulted. They gave instructions about worship. They officiated, of course, at the sacrifices and poured the sacrificial blood on the altar. They were custodians of the Ark and the Law because the Ark of the Covenant contained uh, 
law, the law was placed, the tablets of the law was placed within the Ark of the Covenant. And they were also mediators. They were God's official representatives to the people and the people's official representatives to God. And that, of course, is one of the principal differences between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. Old Testament worship depended upon priests. It was sacerdotal in nature. Sacerdotal in nature. That word will come on the screen for you to see, see it. It means that which pertains to the operation of priests. Priesthood. Priesthood. Now, the priesthood has been removed from one particular tribe, one particular family on, on, the, on the planet. The priesthood now has been given to every believer. We are priests to our God. Peter makes it absolutely clear in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And in that section, he talks about the fact that we are a nation of priests. We are a royal priesthood. And so this means that we don't have to go through a priest to get in touch with God. We don't have to confess our sins to a priest to have our sins forgiven. We can share our problems with each other, but forgiveness comes from God. And the priest who grants forgiveness, his name is Jesus. We don't have a priest on earth. We have a priest in heaven representing us in the presence of God. And this also means that our salvation is not mediated by earthly priests or by human beings. The Bible says there is one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. And so aren't you glad that you don't have to go uh, and find access through a priest in order to get to God? You go to God straight in the name of Jesus Christ. But this function as mediator was characteristic of the priestly role in the Old Testament, pointing, of course, to the coming of Jesus Christ, who would be our great high priest and our only one great mediator that could effectively, permanently bring us into relationship with God. Now, the priests were especially consecrated to God uh, to do this work. And they were especially anointed to do this work. This was not just a question of a practical work. You have to be the one who practically uh, makes sure the sacrifice happens and puts it on the altar and deal with the blood in the prescribed fashion. It was more than a practical role. It was a spiritually anointed role. Only the high priest who carried the anointing oil, who was anointed as high priest, was spiritually empowered by God to do this. And this shows us that Jesus Christ, who is the anointed one, who is the great priest according to the order of Melchizedek, he is anointed to bring us to God. And this shows us again how important it is to see the Spirit of God operating in worship. And so the priests were especially consecrated by anointing and they were chosen and selected by God. Nobody had the right to take this honor upon themselves. That was Jeroboam's great sin. If you remember after the division of the monarchy, when King Solomon uh, had uh, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and Jeroboam rebelled, and then he went up and established the northern kingdom uh, uh, and left uh, Rehoboam down there in the south uh, in, in Jerusalem. And, and Jeroboam said, this is no good because what's going to happen is all my subjects from the northern kingdom are going to go up to Jerusalem and worship in the temple. I'm going to have to reestablish this. And he built two shrines, one in Dan, one in Bethel. He built two idols, those golden calves. And he said, this is, this is how we're going to worship God. Originally, probably, giving him the benefit of the doubt, he was saying, this is how you should worship God. And here is a, an idol which is going to help you concentrate on God. But of course, it was sheer paganism at heart. And uh, he was condemned because he set up this man-made religion. Anybody could become a priest. He selected them. God hadn't, had nothing to do with it. But there in the faithful, loyal worship of God in the temple in Jerusalem, it was only those who were called and appointed and anointed to, uh, by, according to God's pattern and to God's revelation, were legitimate priests. And so the priests were called to mediate between God and the people and to bring uh, together God and the people in a tangible way during the worship life of these people. Now, the priests, again, were the only ones who ministered exclusively to God. 
The priestly ministry is very, very significant. Uh, if you have a look at uh, Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, it says, God speaking to Moses, and he says, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So this shows that God's ultimate purpose was to have the whole nation as priests, uh, who to exist for his praise and glory. You shall be, for me, a very special people. You shall be, for me, a nation of priests. So God says, your purpose, Israel, is, to, is, is a priestly purpose, is to worship me. I am calling you to my presence. I'm calling you to minister to me. And so we are the new covenant people of God. We are the nation of God, which is made up now, not just of Jews, but of Gentiles and every nation. And our purpose as a holy nation is to worship God. And we have that priestly function to offer sacrifices of joy and praise and thanksgiving. And so, of course, uh, it's, it's a possibly even suggested there in, in, in Exodus that God was ready to give this priestly ministry to the whole of the nation. And when God manifested himself, the people fled and said, Moses, you take care of this. We don't want to look on God. We're too frightened. And God, by that, was indicating that the people were not yet ready because the fear was there and the glory that they had, they couldn't cope with it. And it only comes to the blood of Jesus Christ when the blood touches our lives. Only then are we fit for the presence of God. Only then can we enter fully into the presence of God. And apart from a few individuals, priests and prophets, but especially in this context, priests were anointed in order to come into the presence of God. Can you imagine what it was like for Aaron, the high priest, to step into the very presence of God? And if it wasn't for the incense that was blowing there into, into the holy place, he would have been dazzled by the brightness of the glory of God, the actual visible physical manifestation of the presence and the glory of God. And the Bible says we have that glory in all of its deepest spiritual implications, not just the outward visible manifestation of that, but the essential glory of God touches our lives and we are being changed from glory to glory because the Spirit of God, the greatest carrier of the glory of God, the greatest conveyor of the majesty and the glory of God into our lives, lives in the midst of us and manifests amongst us as we worship Him. Glorious, glorious ministry this was. But the priests were the only ones who were enabled by the Spirit to enjoy it and to be part of it. When the priests functioned properly, whether it's the tabernacle or the temple, the glory of God was revealed, and the holy presence of God was manifested. And so when the tabernacle was set up in Exodus, you read about in Exodus chapter 40, and the priests began to function, the glory came. And when the temple was built and dedicated in 2 Chronicles 5, the glory came. And when the priests functioned and ministered according to their anointed purpose, the glory of God came, and the presence of God was there. But when the priests failed in their ministry, the glory of God was withheld. We read about this in 1 Samuel under the ministry of Eli. And you remember, Eli was failing. He was failing in every direction as the priest of the Lord uh, in that generation. And it was a fatherless generation as the priest of the nation was backslidden and the sons of the priest were backslidden. That's why God raised up the prophet Samuel and he was given to the house of the Lord. And then, of course, when uh, the grandchildren were born and uh, the, 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 uh, during the time when she was pregnant, she gave birth to this child. She died in childbirth and she said, we're going to name him Ichabod, which means the glory has departed Kabod means glory. Ikabod means no glory. The glory is taken away. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured, and the priestly ministry had failed. The glory of God had been taken away. We read about it also in the book of Ezekiel. When God shows Ezekiel in a vision, the glory departing from the temple because of the failure of the priests to maintain pure worship and because of the idolatry in the nation. 
And then Ezekiel has a second vision. This time the glory returns to the temple, a renewed temple, a renewed priesthood, as he says prophetically, I will purify the sons of Levi. And so we see here the goal of worship. Our worship is for the presence of God. The goal of worship is the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. That's the purpose of worship. As we worship God, its function is to bring the manifest presence of God as we appreciate Him. And therefore, I say to you prophetically, this is God's purpose in our day and generation, to raise up a generation of His people who openly and actively acknowledge under the anointing of the Holy Spirit their priesthood so that we would worship God in spirit and truth and we would maintain that right worship and as we worship God, God will presence himself in the midst and manifest himself and the glory of God will come back to the church of Jesus Christ and as a result of that, God's purposes will be fulfilled. So you can see we have a great deal to learn from the Old Testament forms of worship and the priesthood was that ministry, I think, that we have a lot to learn from called to the presence of the Lord, the only ministry that was exclusively unto the Lord. Separate for me uh, Aaron and his sons, that they may serve me as priests. We are called to that same exclusive worship. And so, the manifestation of the blessing of God came through the priestly ministry. And we know that that came, of course, into the life of the church by the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. He brought the glory into the church by his priestly ministry. And so the blessing and the glory of God and the presence of God, all these things manifest and flow to us along priestly lines as we fulfill our priestly function of continuous praise and worship to Almighty God. And then we have the ministry of the prophets. Now, some people set the prophets and the priests against each other. And they say the prophets were always prophesying against the priests because the priests were only concerned in pointless ritual. But that's not strictly true. Of course, the prophets did prophesy against the priests who were involved in empty ritual. But the prophets also prophesied against the prophets who were falsely assuring God's people to say, peace, peace, when there was no peace. And we see that really, in God's purposes, the prophets and the priests functioned together. And both were called to bring the life-giving message of God. And in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 18, we, show, we can see how the prophets and the priests were complementary and how they were to work together. Jeremiah says, Then they said, Come, let us devise plans against Jeremiah, for the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come, let us attack him with the tongue, and let us give heed, uh, not give heed to any of his words. Now here we have the negative illustration of the prophets and the priests working together against the purposes of God, but that was not God's purpose for the prophets and priests. He wanted the prophets and priests to stand together, to minister together with the other instituted leaders so that together, prophet, priest, and king, the ministry would flourish. Now it's interesting that Jesus Christ is the perfect prophet, priest, and king. And these three ministries are brought together in one person, in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we cannot set these anointings against one another. They are different functions and different anointings of the Holy Spirit, but they are one and the same function. They are working together. And incidentally, this is how I work so much in my own ministry, in my ministry of discernment as I move in the things of the Spirit. I discern which of the great moves of the Spirit are operating, whether it's a kingly anointing to bring governmental authority, apostolic authority, or authority against powers of darkness and spiritual warfare. I discern whether it's a priestly anointing, which is to bring the presence of God, and out of the presence of God comes all the marvelous benefits of being in His presence. Healing flows from the presence of God. Deliverance flows from the presence of God. Every blessing that comes to you flows from the presence of God. And I also discern whether it's a prophetic anointing, an anointing in which God wants to speak to his people and to touch his people. And so if you've ever seen me minister, you will see that I spend my time 
discerning how the Spirit is leading. And I expect that he's going to be working in one of these three ways or a combination of them as the Holy Spirit, the one Holy Spirit, works according to these different anointings and blends them together at times and weaves them together into that living, interactive experience that we now know to be worship in spirit and truth. Now, of course, the prophets had to criticize dead formality. Uh, we know that uh, these scriptures that I've got for you in the manual, they're quite, quite shocking when you think about them. God says, let's just take one, for example, Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 17. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to the people of God. He is prophesying to Judah. And he says, you people are of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because he says, no good calling yourself people of God if you're living like the devil. And then verse 11, look at this. He attacks the worship life. He says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I'm, a we I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Tough talk. Here we have a typical prophetic tirade against the false institutional, superficial, ritualistic worship of that particular time. And God says, I don't want any of this. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the prophets denied that these things had been instituted by God in the first instance. As I said earlier, the prophets were not criticizing what God did. The prophets were criticizing what the people had done with what God had given them. And the priests and the prophets often worked together side by side to see the prophetic ministry and the priestly ministry come together. Some of the prophets had a room in the temple. The prophets sometimes delivered their message in the context of worship and often related them to the festivals. Some prophets were themselves members of priestly families, for example, uh, Ezekiel. And some psalms also imply that someone spoke in the name of God during the liturgy of worship, during the worship service. There are messages that were coming directly from God. This is possibly the source of some of these statements in the psalms. For example, Psalm 12, verse 5. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. And this has possibly had its origin in, in a prophetic utterance that was made in some kind of priestly situation, some kind of uh, worship situation. It's also to note that the people who were identified as, as Levites were also later called prophets by the same writer. If you compare 2 Chronicles 34, verse 30, with 2 Kings 23, verse 2. And so in both 1 and 2 Chronicles, these Levites are often given prophetic functions, including the utterances of messages on behalf of God during worship. And so we see that prophetic worship is something which is very well established in the Scriptures. David prophetically worshipped God. And those who were the worship tribe, the Levites, who were to assist the priests, they were the kind of deacons to the priests in those days. They were often people who were expected to have a prophetic function. And so we need to reestablish today the prophetic role of worship. Worship is not just leading us into the known. Often, worship is leading us into that which is to be revealed. It is a prophetic thing. And I believe 
That's why in revivals, we have very often a restoration of prophetic worship. As people uh, in times of revival get encouraged by God, they write songs, there's always a renewal of worship, and that is a statement, a prophetic statement about what God is doing and what God is going to do. And so be aware of this as we move in, prof- in these prophetic days to worship God in a prophetic way. And one of the characteristic operations of the Holy Spirit is, prof- is prophecy. When the Spirit comes, there's prophetic revelation. In the last days, God says, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And so if it is worship in spirit, it will be prophetic worship. And we must allow that prophetic dimension to lay hold of us that we may prophesy in our praise and praise in our prophecy. And then we come down to the grassroots. Most worshippers were not prophets, priests, or kings. They were simple, ordinary people in small towns, villages. And most of the Old Testament tells us uh, the, the precise details of... Uh, Uh, rather the Old Testament tells us little about the precise details of their worship. But there is one book that stands out so well above the others which tells us what worship must have meant for the ordinary people and can contribute to our worship today. That's the book of Psalms. And that gives us a a detailed account of the worshipping activities at Jerusalem, the temple in the period of the kings just before the exile. And also it... uh, shows us the way in which ordinary people got together to to worship God. And we're going to come back to have a look at that in the next section. In the next session, we're going to spend time on on, on the Psalms and what that tells us about worship. But just to conclude here and now, Old Testament worship, as we've looked at it in the last two sessions, we remind ourselves what we've learned. We've learned in the Old Testament that God has established clear prescribed patterns of worship. And these patterns are not meant to be carried on into the New Testament. These patterns, however, give us principles which show us which lies at the root of worship. God was saying, you're not going to come before me in any and every way. You are going to stand uh, in the way that I call you to stand. And you're going to experience me as I lead you to experience me and break down every barrier that you may have free access to me by the Holy Spirit in my word, which is the truth. And that brings to an end today's teaching on worship in spirit and truth. And I pray that as you've been watching and listening, God has been drawing you closer and closer to himself. There's no greater thing on earth than being a worshiper of the Father in the name of Jesus. And so until next time, goodbye and God bless you.